arriving in U.S. mail from St. Louis in the original de Havilland DH-4 biplane and 10 bulky gunny sacks are the combined audiobook renditions and supplemental background information as presented in podcast form by moi, me, Robert P. Fitton. Good evening to one and all, wherever in the galaxy you make your home. Sir, can I help you? I don't think so. You don't have anything I want? You don't know that. You have something to do with the Kennedy assassination. What makes you say that? You certainly dress well and have a certain savoir-faire. Do you know Patch Kincaid? Yeah. I knew Patch very well. He saved my life and a few of my friends. I could always trust him to carry the load. He never opened his mouth. Most of all, he was loyal. That's the important thing. Who killed Kennedy? You'll have to contact the researchers on that subject. You'll find the truth sooner or later. Where were you when Kennedy was shot? Vegas, asleep. I got woken up with a phone call and got the news. You like Kennedy? It's not a matter of liking. The man had these college boy ideals. You know how the world's supposed to be, not the way the world is? You can't just try and change everything and think it's going to happen. It's only a few people left who are in on the thick of this. I know, because I was there too. Stay safe. And like I told Patch, it's always good not to ask too many questions. Just do as you're told. It's the only way to stay alive. Return to Dallas originally detailed everything that happened to Patch Kincaid from his vendor table in Dealey Plaza until he appeared in Spokane, Washington in 1963. When I rewrote the novel 1963, adding new research as well as what I did not include in the original book, I decided to retitle the novel Return to Dallas, which became the second book in the Patch Kincaid series. The entire chapter on Lee Oswald, David Phillips at the Southland Center in Dallas was rewritten because the truth was uncovered by Dr. John Newman. Patch arrives in Spokane, Washington in 1963. His memory has been targeted and he has a note instructing him to meet Johnny Rosselli at an appointed time in Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles. How and Why Patch Returned in 1963 is in a small book called Transition. I wanted Patch in the Return to Dallas book to be like a Jason Bourne, not knowing who he is and why he was there. Nor would the reader know, unless you bought Transitions. Two things seem odd about the Return to Dallas book. Placing science fiction in the shadow of the most researched encyclopedic event of the 20th century seems out of place. I can hear the researchers and conspiracy buffs cringing and moaning and groaning. In Return to Dallas, the forces producing the movement through time are emphasized, not the machine. The novel is designed to maintain a strong narrative and at the same time highlight the mass of information surrounding the assassination. It's essential, and was essential, to footnote this information. Simply put, everyone has a theory or an assertion about the Kennedy assassination. I wanted to demonstrate why I was postulating the facts as I saw them. The science fiction makes it possible to see the assassination unfold. This is based on witness testimony as well as measurable scientific results. My insertion of the footnotes may seem top-heavy to the plot, because most novels don't have over 800 footnotes. Conversely, the plot may be antithetical to the narrative because there's so much data. Here's the surprise. It works, and it's a unique approach. Most who research the assassination study a niche. The idea most promoted by Penn Jones, and then research the hell out of it, he said. Well, I'm heading to a central point, and that point was made in an interview with researcher and TV icon John Barber. Do we or do we not want to solve the JFK assassination? Or how much do we really want the truth? If we were dead serious in tracking down Jack Kennedy's killers, then we'd all be out in front of the Justice Department by the millions demanding answers to the Kennedy assassination until we got them. I truly believe this. I'm not diminishing research by any means. Where would we be without what has been learned over the past 60 years? It's all about political capital. 
In either case, raising the public consciousness. Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, which raised the public consciousness to slavery's sins. Tom Paine's common sense turned British subjects into Americans by demonstrating the king and parliament's usurpation of power from the people. The mystery of the world's creatures was riveted into the public consciousness by Darwin's Origin of Species. Did the jungle by Upton Sinclair alert the public to the abomination of the meatpacking industry in the United States? What about 1984 or the Grapes of Wrath? To Kill a Mockingbird is another example. Things change, wrongs are righted when people listen and incorporate the narrative into their consciousness. Some say I recklessly change parts of the November 22nd narrative and have done a disservice to solving of the crime. No way. I wanted a salient point to be foremost in the public's mind. Oswald was supposed to die from sinister forces. Jack Ruby was the one man with the means and the will to shoot Oswald dead. How Oswald dies in my book is less relevant than the fact that he was supposed to be taken out. Obviously, no one involved in this operation wanted Oswald's mouth to flap, and it was beginning to flap by Saturday night, and then he was dead. Unfortunately, Jack Ruby links for the Patch Kincaid series are all in the pre-Dallas book. Bringing raw history into the body of the book is one thing the audio version of The Long Road to Dallas accomplishes. I began doing the audio for my book simply because I was listening to see if the story flowed nicely and at the correct pace. Since an author knows his characters according to science fiction legend Harlan Ellison, what better way to accentuate their qualities than to have the author read or perform? The Kennedy assassination, more than many historical events, demands that you get it right. Many people can talk themselves into a theory where the place to start is actually with the facts. And people lie. Just what are the facts? That's not an easy thing, especially when multiple points of view are presented and countervailing sets of research are telling you otherwise. And let's add the big one here. The people who contrived this atrocity were not playing games. They never wanted any of this to see the light of day. And if you did find something significant, that knowledge led you into a black hole. Try and get out of that one. They never counted on the information bonanza called the internet. Because when you uncover detail through internet documents, you're led to multiple shooters from multiple entities in multiple locations. And in step the cover-up artists, also from multiple sources, and they lead you astray. And who would believe any of it anyway? Robert P. Fitton. All of my books are available in paperback, Kindle, and audio at www.fittenbooks.com. You can listen to all my audio books on audible.com. Just type in Robert P. Fitton. Thank you and good night.